Well, good morning, Maury. As you know, or perhaps I should introduce you properly, as Mr. Maurice R. Foreman, member of the Board of Trustees of RIT. As you know, I've been carrying on this oral history of RIT. At the time of my retirement, I felt that there were many people retiring that carried with them a great many aspects of the Institute's history. And it would be interesting to get their reactions and reminiscences and recollections on tape. So that is the reason that I contacted you, and you very kindly offered to be interviewed. When did you first become interested in the Institute, Maury? Well, it's practically about, I would say, about 25 years ago, uh, when uh, I was with the B. Foreman Company, and uh, I was working closely with the School of Retailing at the time, and uh, Ms. Hogadon was uh, then uh, very active in this area. She was great. She was head of the School of Retailing, dean of the College of Business. That's right. Well, that was about 25 years ago. And then you were appointed to the board? I was appointed to the board uh, roughly 19 years ago. 19 years ago. Well, let's see, that takes us back to about 1957, doesn't it? Right. Good. And uh, who were I'm, some of the... I'm glad, uh, Leo, that you're still good on your mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't push me any further. <laughs> uh, who were some of the key figures on the board at that time? Or... Well, at that time... Um, as I recall, Albert Chapman was uh, active on the board. Carl Hallower was on the board. Uh, um, Herbert Eisenhardt was on the board. Walter Todd. Uh, it was really uh, composed of uh, the top industrialists uh, and manufacturers of our area. Now, Mr. Gleason was still uh, chairman. Oh, yes, he was chairman of the board and uh, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. A great fellow, wasn't he? Now, let's see, of course, Dr. Ellington was the uh, president. Do you remember some of the faculty members that uh, you mentioned Ms. Hogadon? Yes, and of course, you were uh, very active at the time, and uh, the, uh, the head of the uh, uh, science uh, department now, his, his name just slipped. Ralph Van Pearson? That's correct. Uh, Ralph was uh, active at the time. And uh, then, uh, well, there were... Harold Brennan. Harold Brennan was very active in the uh, arts uh, school for American and, uh, and school for the American craftsmen, yes. Yeah. Now, let's see, in 1957, <coughs> the vote had not been uh, held on the new campus. Oh, no. Uh, we were still down at 65 Plymouth Avenue South. What were some of the most pressing problems? Well, uh, I personally was very concerned uh, about the general area of the uh, Institute at that time. It uh, started to uh, disintegrate, and I could see it. The buildings uh, that were put up uh, many years before were starting to uh, show their wear and tear. And uh, the uh, Institute, as far as the uh, students were concerned, was still uh, moving along very well. They had uh, the new uh, Clark Building, and uh, the uh, Ritter uh, uh, ice, rink. ice rink was uh, completed at that time. And uh, it was a well-going concern. However, the entire area seemed to be blighted. Going downhill there. That's correct. Forward. That's correct. And it wasn't until... Now let's see, hadn't the state also said something about the possibility they're taking part of the uh, Institute property to extend the uh, inner loop. The, highway, uh, the yeah. highways in the, within the city, yes. Uh, there was some talk about that uh, at that time. and uh, But it wasn't really uh, uh, really settled mm -hmm. in any form. But uh, there was sort of an undercurrent of the fact, should we move? Should we try to push back the boundaries here in the third ward? Yes, there was no question about that, and uh, then it was, uh, uh, oh, discussed uh, at several meetings, and uh, the, uh, uh, finally it was brought up at the uh, uh, trustees meeting that was held at the Rochester Club, uh, I think the year was, uh, was it 1960? 
The the actual vote, you mean? Yes. I believe that was in November '61. That's right. It was about brought, that. Time. Yes. Brought it to a vote. And, uh, as you may remember, that was a momentous evening. Yes, that was a uh, one of the highlights uh, of my association with RIT because it meant so much. Um, I recall very vividly that we had a, a complete uh, trustees meeting that night. Uh, I don't think that there was any absentees. And uh, after a, a very nice dinner, uh, we uh, deliberated on the subject, should we move or stay in the third <laughs> ward? And um, would you like me to tell a few things about well, that evening? Very much, I think, because that was a All right, tremendous well, evening. I, uh, of course, as you recall, I was uh, uh, really uh, considered then a freshman on the Board of Trustees <laughs> because I had only been active for three or four years. Yes. Uh, and uh, the various gentlemen uh, made their speeches, uh, pro and con, about the move. And it was very interesting to hear how very definite some of the members were against the uh, move. Yes. Uh, at the time, you, you might recall that uh, Gilbert J.C. McCurdy, who was then on the board of uh, RIT along with me, made a very uh, great plea for the uh, Institute to remain downtown because, as he explained, that Maury Foreman and their family and the McCurdy's and their family uh, were so involved in the rehabilitation of downtown in connection with Midtown. Sure. And that we had put all our money and our efforts and time into that project and that wouldn't this be a great uh, occasion to keep uh, RIT down in the third ward at, at, on the same basis. And uh, he pleaded uh, that the trustees would uh, vote in, in that way. Well, of course, uh, it came time to uh, have my say, and <laughs> I, I got up and uh, said that, uh, gentlemen, this is the first time that I have ever differed with my partner, uh, either privately or publicly, but I had to differ with uh, Gilbert McCurdy because I felt that, uh, uh, as I expressed that night, I didn't want uh, Gilbert's grandchildren or any of the other members' grandchildren to be coming to a college for learning in that environment. Yes. And I felt that it would continue to uh, depreciate and decay. And I felt that the uh, move was necessary. And that was as far as my remarks were concerned. And then it was followed by Jim Gleason, who uh, a great, great individual. Certainly at, the, at the age of 88, I think, at the time, uh, made a wonderful speech. He recited the time that uh, George Todd Sr., who called upon him at the time that the University of Rochester was moving from the Goodman Street uh, area to the uh, River Campus, which was then the Oak Hill Country Club. And uh, when they decided to make that move, uh, Jim Gleason said that he was, uh, he approved the, the move, but he thought that they were very uh, short-sighted in not getting enough land, and he didn't feel that that 18 acre, 18 whole golf course was big enough to <laughs> house the future of the University of Rochester. And he said, now I have pleaded with, uh, with Mark Ellingson and the rest of the trustees to buy enough land so that RIT could move out into Henrietta. And he said, you may think that 13 or 1400 acres is enough tonight, gentlemen, but I think that you should really go after 2000 acres. <laughs> and it was quite a speech. And, uh, at age 88. At the amazing. age of 88, yes. Amazing. Well, that's interesting, Maury, because no one else has related that. I also remember a very statesmanlike uh, comment that uh, Ritter Shumway and Hetty Shumway made. Because, of course, of all people, they, with Brackett Clark, had put a lot of money into the Ritter Clark uh, gym and ice rink. Right. But uh, as I remember it, Ritter got up and he said, uh, gentlemen, ladies, uh, Mrs. Shumway and I had driven around the Third Ward, and uh, 
although we have made this uh, contribution downtown here, we feel that the Institute should move out to a new campus. That took a lot of uh, courage and statesmanlike uh, attitude. Well, I, I'd like to uh, say, uh, Leo, that there was some bad feelings mm -hmm. among some of the trustees at the time because those that felt that the the college should uh, remain in the third ward were very adamant about uh, the subject. And uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, two or three of those trustees uh, really uh, uh, never attended another meeting of the Board of Trustees of RIT as a result of that uh, decision that night. Yes, well, that was a uh, time for strong feelings. And it's justified. You can see how people wanted us to remain as sort of an anchor down in that section of town. Yeah. At the west end of Main Street there, we, we were providing somewhat of an anchor. But uh, it's true that uh, fewer and fewer parents were allowing their daughters to attend down there. And there had been muggings, there had been fights between our students and the neighborhood uh, youngsters. So uh, you're perfectly right, it was time to seriously consider the move. Well, those are interesting uh, recollections. Uh, carrying this a little bit further, in the 50s when you came on the board, what would you say was the general attitude of the business and industrial community towards RIT as an institution? Well, uh, of course, the uh, the uh, industrial community was, I would say, uh, dependent upon RIT uh, for their the, for the development of their own employees, and uh, it worked both ways. It was helpful to the institute as well as to industry. And uh, they worked very closely with uh, the, uh, the, the teaching staff and the students at RIT. And it was very helpful to the general economy of our community. Good enough. Uh, I've forgotten, were there members of your family that were interested in the Institute at all? Uh, well, my father, of course, being in the retail business, was very much interested in the uh, School of Business and Retailing. And in those days, uh, the School of Retailing uh, highlighted uh, sub-subjects as uh, uh, display, window trimming, uh, salesmanship, and uh, uh, the, uh, the art of uh, markup and markdown and, <laughs> and uh, all the other uh, characteristics of the retail uh, uh, business. And uh, my father, I'd like to uh, give you this personal anecdote uh, that my father was interested in um, RIT in many areas because uh, uh, when he bought his first automobile uh, back in uh, 1915 uh, uh, or 1960, uh, the first thing he thought about was to get somebody to drive it. And uh, there was a young man that he had known uh, Henry Jarrett. He was just uh, 16 years old, but he thought he would make a great mechanic and a chauffeur. So <laughs> he sent him to uh, the Mechanics Institute to learn uh, the mechanics of the automobile uh, and uh, how to drive it. And he uh, was the chauffeur for my father for some 18 or 20 years. Well, but great. in those days, you had to know how to change a tire and to sure. change a spark plug and uh, things like that and fix a fan belt. That's right. Now you don't dare touch those things. So that I would say that uh, from our family's point of view, my sister, when she uh, uh, became engaged, and in those years, uh, young ladies uh, spent about two years during the period of their engagement, and their parents usually sent the young ladies to RIT so that they could, uh, what was then Mechanics Institute, yes. to learn how to cook for their future uh, husbands. <laughs> So that was quite a uh, uh, innovation at the time. Well, good enough. That's interesting. So now we've talked a little bit about the, some of the factors that led to the serious discussion as to whether the Institute uh, should uh, consider moving to the new campus or not, and some of the feelings of the board members. Uh, do you feel now that uh, some of the board members that might have been on the board then and voted against it and they're still on the board, have uh, come around to the conclusion that it was a good idea after all? 
Oh, I don't think there's any question but what everyone has been uh, uh, enthusiastic about the move. And uh, I see very frequently many of the, some of the members that were on the board at the time, and they're much more enthusiastic every year sure. as we move <coughs> along. Well, it's uh, difficult to say what would have happened to the Institute if we'd stayed downtown. Well, I don't think there's any question in my mind that it would have unfolded eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we didn't have the physical plant to uh, take care of the needs of what the industry was demanding. Yes. And it's just impossible to push back the boundaries far enough to obtain a decent campus or to change the neighborhood. Oh, no, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now, of course, once the decision had been made to move, this involved the raising of a great deal of money. Yes. Uh, do you remember some of the reactions and uh, attitudes of the members of the board towards this $18.8 million campaign? That yes, that was a gigantic sum. That was uh, equivalent to what, uh, in the earlier years, the, uh, the United States was uh, raising for the First World War <laughs> bonds. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have been in various drives over the last 50 years for community uh, enterprises, but I don't know of any uh, that was as spirited and as well received and accepted as the 18.8 uh, .8 million drive for the Rochester Institute of Technology. As I remember, there was a great deal of work, and, but uh, maybe they didn't quite make the due date, but they did make it within a year or so. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. it was made, and of course, subsequently, uh, as we know now, uh, we're in the present uh, business of trying to raise $42 million. Million. <laughs> It's amazing how times change. <laughs> Going back to the uh, Keppel Kimball Dooley report, which was made in the mid-20s, as I remember it, they stated that if the, income, if the Institute had an income, a uh, short income of about $100,000 a year, uh, this would be very satisfactory. So times change. Uh, dollar doesn't mean quite so much. No, but uh, with this change out of the uh, new campus, you realize that uh, when you look at the uh, balance sheet and realize that today our budget is $50 million, where in those years it was in the hundreds of thousands. Yes. And our student body was uh, made up quite differently than what it is today. And uh, the curriculum is uh, completely changed, if you will. We still maintain the School of Engineering and the School of Business, but it's in a different complexion. Well, certainly the Institute has uh, changed, but uh, I know the borrowing of many millions from the State Dormitory Authority was one thing that uh, bothered the Mark Ellingson in the beginning because he made such a... a uh, thing, you know, such a pride of having a balanced budget on. And this borrowing money from the outside was a little uh, going a little bit against the grain, but uh, that certainly was necessary. And uh, it was done at a very propitious time, and the timing really was just great because if you realize that had we waited another eight to ten years, uh, the price uh, interest on those bonds would have been materially affected. As I remember, they were borrowed at uh, around four percent. Uh, a little under four, uh, 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 a little under five percent, so yeah. that it was averaging around four uh, percent in that neighborhood. Well, that uh, would be very nice to be able to borrow money these days at that figure, wouldn't it? Well, Maury, uh, you've been much concerned with the center of Rochester. What would you say have been some of the major changes of the Rochester and business and industrial community since the end of World War II? Well, of course, uh, I think the major change that took place in Rochester was the, uh, uh, the development of Midtown uh, Plaza. Uh, that was an undertaking that was done privately by two families. Uh, and, uh, the it Foremans was, and the McCurdy's. Uh, yes, the Foremans and the McCurdy's. And um, incidentally, uh, I might add at this time, 
that there has never been a better relationship between competitors, <laughs> uh, uh, McCurdy's and Foreman's, and uh, we never had one argument to this day about the need for the development of uh, downtown Rochester and how it came about. That's marvelous. Now, uh, and of course, uh, after we developed that, we realized that we uh, changed streets in Rochester. The extension of Broad Street was necessary. Uh, we closed off other streets like Cortland and uh, Euclid Street. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, there was other buildings that uh, came about as a result of Midtown. Yes. Uh, the uh, Security Trust Building was the first building that was put up. Uh, the Downtowner Motel was the second building that was put up. The, uh, the third building of really consequence was the uh, uh, Xerox building uh, with its uh, bridges connected to Midtown. Uh, then we've had the uh, Lincoln First building uh, that's been put up. And uh, the, the Marine, that's correct. And then, of course, the Marine Midland bank uh, building uh, on the other yes. area so that there's been really uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, in actual building as a result of what Midtown started. Well that certainly took a tremendous amount of courage and imagination on the part of the Foremans and the McCurdy's uh, to get started with that. Yes. You must have felt sometimes that you were pretty far out on the limb. Well, Leo, I can confess to you now that it's all over. There were many, many sleepless nights because uh, both McCurdy's uh, and their uh, Gilbert and Gordon McCurdy and their wives and family and Fred and Maury Foreman and their wives and family uh, were on the paper. Surely. And uh, it was a very, very difficult time. When did uh, when was ground first broken for Midtown? When did you open? Uh, the uh, ground was uh, started in 1960, uh, really it started just before 1960, and uh, we opened it in uh, April of 1962. Uh, you can well imagine how uh, this entire complex was uh, formed, created, and finished within within two and a half to three years. Now this couldn't possibly have been done if we had used uh, uh, local, county, or uh, federal assistance. Uh, but we did it because it was private capital and we were able to undertake it in that quick Move way. ahead as rapidly as that. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of other changes that have, have taken place in the Rochester industrial community since the end of World War II. Uh, with regard to local companies becoming part of national conglomerates. Would you want to comment on that? Yes, that is one of the problems that uh, RIT is going to face in the future. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Leo, that uh, uh, Rochester industry was uh, home-owned, if you will. Uh, but you realize that uh, such firms as Todd were sold out to Burroughs and uh, such firms as uh, uh, General Dynamics bought uh, Stromberg Carlson. And uh, I could name dozens of firms that uh, uh, were taken over by other out-of-town, out-of-area uh, conglomerates, if you will. And in many cases, they moved their headquarters away from Rochester. Of course, this uh, has an effect, if you will, on the, the, the future role of uh, local industry to an institute like ours. Correct. And um, I am sure that as a result, that we're going to have some benefits from this because RIT is going to be more national in scope than what we have been in the past. And as a result of this, we're going to be eventually international. Now, speaking of that subject, uh, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf uh, came into being in connection with RIT because of what we were doing for our local industries. And uh, 
that has given us a flavor of a, a national scope. So that uh, eventually, I think that this will uh, uh, be a real benefit on an international scale. Now that's an interesting uh, reaction, and it's about the first one I've had, saying it's going to be a benefit, because many people feel that with the loss of a locally owned industry, uh, there has been a change in attitude on the part of the national firms. And this is an interesting point of view that you have, and I think a very wholesome one, a very new one. Well, I believe strongly that the future of the Institute will be from national and international organizations. And it's very interesting to talk to such uh, people as uh, Dean uh, Bob Johnson, who heads up our School for American Crafts and, and uh, other areas in that field. And uh, he tells me that uh, uh, industry from Sweden is interested in our furniture making department, if you will. And uh, now in our glass works, uh, students are planning to go to Murano in Italy and uh, other parts of the world. So that there'll be an exchange of students, ideas, and faculty, and this will broaden our base. Well, that's great, General. I think we're about out of this tape on this side, so what we better do is just turn it over. Well, that's a wholesome point of view that uh, this will be a benefit to RIT and that uh, we will profit from it in the long run. For more, do you remember some of the problems and the frustrations in the move to the new campus? Uh, oh, in that uh, area, uh, I have to give credit to uh, Mark Ellingson, who uh, was a complete general in the uh, in the development of the new campus he worked with uh, all the great architectural firms uh, the builders and uh, he was in his shirt sleeves morning and night uh, seeing that the whole transition occurred rapidly and without too many flaws and now as you look at the uh, uh, the operation you see that it was uh, very successful. There's another thing that Mark was able to uh, uh, develop his uh, personnel from the Board of Trustees. Uh, Artie uh, Stern uh, worked very closely with Mark in connection with that. Uh, Brackett Clark, uh, uh, John Pike, and Tom Judson, uh, and uh, Don uh, McMaster. Uh, these were all individuals that had experience with large firms and uh, were very helpful in the development. They certainly were. Now, you were active, were you not, on the uh, fund campaign? That's right. And uh, you probably worked with Al Davis there and with oh, yes, Mark, too. Yes, and uh, I'm so grateful that uh, Al is still uh, uh, pulling such a heavy oar in this present campaign that we have in uh, raising the $42 million. Well, Al had a good uh, uh, mentor and came to Mark Ellingson, but there's nothing Al enjoys more than uh, contacting people and yes. bringing them And, of on. course, uh, uh, Mark uh, was a great teacher in so many regards, so many respects. Uh, as you mentioned, that Al was, uh, had the great mentor of uh, Mark. Mark knew how to talk to people and uh, really get them to give Willingly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a rare treat, rare trait, I should say. Uh, now, you've served in many capacities and many activities on the board. I know that uh, you were chairman of the Education Committee for a long while. You may still be, for all I know. You uh, have been trustees representative of the Policy Council. You, you're now co-chairman of the 150th Anniversary Fund. Uh, of these, which uh, has given you the most satisfaction? Well, Leo, it's hard to uh, differentiate uh, uh, between any of these subjects because they're all so interesting and they're all so uh, vital to the college and to me personally. Um, they, in speaking of the policy committee, uh, that was formed uh, uh, by Paul Miller, really, uh, uh, with the original idea coming from Mark, but 
nevertheless, it was expanded. It expanded quickly. Yeah. And uh, it was very interesting to see how uh, the composition of one third students, one third faculty, and one third uh, realized that uh, there's always been a, uh, an interest on the part of the faculty to uh, uh, keep moving ahead with new ideas to. Uh, so that it could be helpful to uh, local and national industry. And uh, sub some subjects uh, like uh, the uh, areas in uh, biochemistry and photography and business uh, with the computers. And then, uh, of course, we can't forget uh, that the NTID uh, necessitated uh, new subjects, too. A whole new series of subjects and at yes. different levels. That's correct. Because of the background of the young people coming into it. But you've also served as a member of the National Advisory Group. That's yes, right. That's been very exciting. Um, the one thing that uh, I keep uh, reminding everyone about is the fact that we must get more people to come out to the campus to see what is going on and what's taking place out there. And uh, when uh, I have visitors to Rochester, I bring them out to the campus and uh, uh, they don't know anything about the NTID, and uh, once I get them into that building, I find it very difficult for them to leave to go over to the other parts <laughs> of the campus. But uh, it's very exciting to see youngsters come from all over the country uh, taking up these courses, and you realize that uh, they haven't had the education that the average uh, student going into college has had and their uh, learning level has been quite uh, reduced. Uh, and yet they're coming along very well, and uh, it, it's really an inspiration. Well, I had the opportunity of interviewing Bob Frazina just earlier this week to get that on tape. Uh, and I was uh, amazed and greatly pleased at Bob's explanation of the, the placement record they've had not only with their graduates, but with their cooperative students here in the business. It's an amazing community. fact that it's well over 90 percent. Well, that's right, and uh, this has really given the youngsters a, a new lease on life. Right. Well, that's fine. Well, to change the subject just slightly, Maury, uh, you have known Mark Ellingson over many, many years. We've mentioned one or two of uh, Mark's uh, contributions. What would you say are some of the greatest contributions that uh, Dr. Ellingson made during his 33 years as president? Well, I, I would think that it was his uh, ability to select people uh, to work with him and the Institute. Uh, not only from the point of view of uh, uh, the teaching staff but the, uh, and administrative staff, but uh, uh, in other areas. Uh, he had a great uh, way of working with people. And of course, when you come down to it, uh, the best part of a business is its organization. That's really what makes it tick. And Mark had that ability of uh, collecting a good organization. Yes, as you look back and think of the status of the Institute when Mark took over as president in 1936, right? The Institute wasn't very large and it wasn't on very firm ground financially. That's correct. But certainly he was able to command the respect of the business and industrial leaders, that many, many of them, uh, on the Board of Trustees, and those that he didn't get on the Board of Trustees at least uh, had a favorable attitude towards uh, the well, I, I would say that Mark basically uh, has always been a very good businessman. Uh, he's been an educator, but basically he's been a businessman. And uh, it's been very amusing to me because uh, when we uh, were fortunate enough to uh, get his uh, successor in uh, Paul Miller, uh, I, re I was on that committee that uh, was searching for a successor to Paul, or to uh, Mark. And uh, it was very interesting to uh, note at the time that uh, Paul was an educator. Yes. And uh, he professed to know nothing about business. Uh, but uh, like Mark, he has turned out to be a great businessman. Yes, certainly the uh, way they balance the budget year after year. That's correct. The first uh, two or three years after the move to the new campus. It's been amazing. Well, you realize that uh, when Paul came here, his first year in operation, 
we had a deficit of uh, three to four million dollars. Yes. And uh, he just decided that he couldn't work under those circumstances <laughs> and changed it. So we have a balanced budget. Well, he has uh, drawn about himself uh, a great uh, group, too. Todd Bullard, we've mentioned, Jim Buckholz. Right. Uh, people of that caliber are fine. And then, of course, Al Davis is right. still active in the fundraising area and working right. with the board. And Fred Smith. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Fred Smith in the student personnel area. And of course that has become a, a new factor in the life of the uh, Institute because we have so many students that are living on campus today that we didn't have in the old days. That's right, and the student uh, attitude is quite different. Uh, uh, I think you're entirely correct that uh, Paul Miller is very definitely an educator. Uh, he also has the patience. That's correct. To sit down with the students and, and uh, That's listen to them. Uh, some of uh, those of us that were the older generation didn't quite have that patience, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, what are, are there other changes that you've noticed under, uh, under Paul Miller's leadership? Yes, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and you have just brought it up, and that is the patience and the understanding and, uh, of the other fellow. And uh, Paul is a good listener, uh, as Mark was. And uh, this is a great uh, attribute. And I believe that uh, uh, one of the strengths that we have now is the organizational strength. Uh, that's composed of the administration and the faculty and the trustees. And uh, I have been uh, fortunate enough to work with many colleges uh, and I find that the trustees at RIT are the most working group of trustees uh, that I've ever uh, uh, really been uh, privileged to work with. Well, that's very encouraging to hear. And I think it's true you know, due to Mark's uh, ability to work with people and now Paul in quite a different way. Right. For working. Now, we've mentioned some of the changes that have taken place in the local business and industrial picture. Uh, you've touched on the change as you visualize it from pretty much a local or certainly a state institution to one that will become nationally and even internationally known. Uh, what are the areas that you, in which you feel the Institute will make the greatest uh, strides there, those colleges or those departments? Well, I can uh, easily see that the, uh, the College of Engineering, College of Science, uh, the College of Business, uh, even in the arts area, I can see that uh, we can do very well in the uh, area of furniture making. Uh, we, uh, I was told just recently that uh, one of our graduates is uh, one of the top designers for the outstanding industrial engineering firm of uh, Raymond Lowy. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, so this uh, gives credit to uh, uh, our students getting out into the uh, hinterlands and uh, abroad. Yeah. Now, I, I believe that uh, with the uh, modern transportation, if you will, uh, the new plane just arrived the other day from Paris to Washington in a little less than three hours. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, we are in that uh, time schedule uh, of uh, this fast transportation so that there is no longer a long lag between country and country or state and state. And uh, as I say, we're, we're right in the throes of becoming national in scope. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. One of our uh, faculty members has just been awarded a Fulbright Fellowship for a study in Finland, Dr. Robert Hacker, School of Printing. And, uh, of course, printing another 
area where the Institute is known nationally at, at the moment, and uh, we also have many foreign, foreign students. And of course in graphic arts. Graphic arts and photography. Photography, yeah. and all these subjects are so important to the uh, commercial life of our country. Of course, we don't have a national football team. Well, I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> so are some of the rest of us. <laughs> we don't have some of the problems that they have either no. in other places. Well, uh, Maury, with the continued growth in the number of students and faculty and programs, do you see some real financial problems for the Institute in the years ahead? Well, like any business, we have to be constantly uh, aware of financial problems as we go into the next decade. Uh, I feel that uh, our IT is blessed with good management, and if this can continue, I think that we uh, should have less of a problem than other institutions. Uh, I believe that, uh, for my own personal opinion, I trust that our IT doesn't grow too fast, too much in enrollment. I'd rather see us constantly grow in quality. Uh, that's going to make us more outstanding than anything else. It isn't the numbers that mean something, it's the quality that will be meaningful in the future. Yes, there's no great value in just being the largest institution. That there is. I think uh, Mr. Gleason used to impress that on uh, Mark Ellingson. That, uh, uh, make yourself uh, a high-quality institution in a relatively few areas. That's correct. And of course, his own company, the Gleason Works, uh, has made a life history of that. That's right. They've adhered to that policy. That's right. Yeah. That's good. Well, I certainly appreciate your willingness to be interviewed, Maury. It's been marvelous to get this on tape. Well, uh, Leo, I, I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed knowing you and Mary and uh, Mark and all the other wonderful friends that I've had at RIT. And it's a, real privilege and I hope you have many, many happy years in your retirement. And you remember, I'm retired too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks much, Maureen. The same to you and Maxine. Thank you.